Well, hello there. Uh, this is Mr. Stromberg, and I'm going to teach you today about the next two artists that we're learning about here. Today we're going to talk about uh, the two paintings you see in front of you here, and these will be the next ones that you'll need to know for your slide quiz. So we've got Edouard Manet's Luncheon on the Grass, and we have Degas' Four Dancers. So let's jump into it. Pretty amazing thing happened in France in the 1800s. Uh, this magical device came about that all of a sudden uh, you open it up, you take the lens off and uh, expose it to the light and uh, or open an aperture, I guess, and uh, expose it to the light and it records a moment of actual time as an image. We have our phones and we take however many thousands of images um, you know, all the time on our phones. We, we don't stop often to think about what a ridiculous invention photography is. And it had monumental impacts on art. Um, all of a sudden, um, everyone wants one of these amazing recorded moments of actual time. And uh, artists were faced with a real decision. Because what's the point of art if you have this magical device that could control... Uh, uh, images of, of things as they actually look, realistic images. <clears throat> Art has to be about something different. It had profound effects upon painters uh, in France. This slide you're seeing right here is actually one of the first uh, photographs uh, ever taken. Um, there are other earlier grainier ones, but you might see down at the bottom corner there that there's a, uh, a gentleman uh, getting his shoes shined there. And the reason that he's um, visible there and there are no other um, cars, or not cars, because this is way before cars, no other horses, buggies, people walking anywhere that we can see is because uh, the apertures, um, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the exposure time uh, was really, really long uh, on these early cameras. So uh, he was probably standing still, getting his shoe shine, and that's why we can see him, and that's why uh, we can't see everybody else, because they blurred out. Anyway, um, what an amazing invention, and it had profound impacts on art. Uh, and that leads us to a brand new movement in art called Impressionism. Impressionism. We've been talking about, um, obviously, art from the Renaissance, Baroque period, into the Rococo, and uh, lastly, in France at least, talking about David, uh, when we talked about the death of Marat, uh, in the, uh, and, and also with Goya in Spain, uh, Turner in Britain, American artists. So um, now all of a sudden mid-1800s, we've got photography. Something very different is going to start in France. It's actually the beginning of what we call modernism, or the modern era. And a painter who is seen very much as the kind of the godfather of modernism, as we call it, uh, is this guy, um, Edouard Manet. So M-A-N-E-T is his name, Manet. And this is called The Luncheon on the Grass. The Luncheon on the Grass. Uh, here's a picture of Manet, actually, since we're talking about photographs. Um, by all accounts, uh, was a ginger, had bright red hair and a red beard. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that uh, I just enjoy talking about Manet is that, um, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of a instigator. He's someone who you get the impression um, uh, really enjoyed getting under people's skin and, you know, um, asking the question why and maybe enjoyed... Uh, angering uh, people a little bit, and enjoyed being different, because that's what Impressionism was. One of the um, odd things about Impressionism is it's probably as popular now as it's ever been. If you um, think about the kind of images that you see uh, replicated on people's um, walls, you know, you'll, we'll talk about Vincent van Gogh later, um, and uh, Monet, you know, uh, we'll talk about him later as well, but the kind of pictures you see at the dentist's office or the kind of uh, art that people who know nothing about art seem to know about. Impressionism is something that people are really drawn to. And why is that? Well, it, as you'll see, it's very colorful. Um, and uh, it um, is an art that a lot of people find really appealing. Um, and uh, But what people don't know is that Impressionism is actually uh, open rebellion and open war on what art was at the time. Uh, there was a very um, set way that art was supposed to be if you lived in France in the mid-1800s. 
Uh, so let's look at that. Uh, this is not Manet. Uh, this is uh, by uh, one of his contemporaries. His name is Ernst Messonnier. And Ernst Messonnier is the exact picture of what you're supposed to be if you're an artist in the mid-1800s in France. Uh, so have a look at this picture. This is called Friedland. I actually read an entire book uh, that compared uh, these two artists and, and talked about this the whole idea of Impressionism as open war on the art establishment, and this is a great example. So, um, check it out. Here's Emperor Napoleon. You can see him there on his white horse uh, towards the middle of the image, just slightly off to the left. And uh, this is showing um, um, a historic battle there, Napoleon on his white horse, raising his tricorn hat, saluting his troops as they gallop across in front of him there. Um, it's extremely um, detailed image. Get your nose right up to your screen if you can. Look at it carefully, and uh, you'll see that it's um, uh, ridiculously detailed. Every little blade of grass down in the bottom corner there, uh, those horses, particularly the ones galloping right at us there, uh, super detailed in their uh, muscular uh, look of their uh, bodies there. All the little uniforms of the soldiers, all the sabers raised in the air, even the soldiers way off in the distance. Painted uh, with uh, extreme detail, probably, you know, with the tiniest of brushes and, and perfect um, mimicking of real-life colors. And uh, that's the whole idea. This is what's called academic painting. So if you live in France at this time, you're going to uh, study at the Academic Academy, um, and you're going to copy the works of the old masters. So you're going to look at uh, sketches by uh, great Renaissance uh, painters that we've talked about. You're going to copy their paintings. You're going to learn those body positions. You're going to learn anatomy. You're going to learn how to copy uh, colors and locate colors as perfectly as possible. And you're expected to show this level of detail. Now, that sounds all, uh, all well and good. And, and I'm not saying, um, well, I'm not telling you that this is a bad image. In fact, it's an incredibly impressive image. But here's what artists uh, like uh, Manet didn't like about it. It was too stodgy, too academic and it was all about perfection, and it represented um, an attitude towards art that they did not um, like at all. In fact, they hated. So just a few funny tangents about this painting to show you um, and maybe understand why they hated it so much. Uh, Messinier, when he made this picture, uh, went uh, so far as to purchase Napoleon's actual army uniform or his coat, um, from this same battle, uh, and then paid a model to stand in the same position, who was the same height as Napoleon, in order to get the uh, look of his uh, costume exactly right there, or his uniform. Um, he uh, went to the site of the battle and uprooted a piece of the grass from the battle, brought it back to his house, his estate, and uh, spent years cultivating that grass, growing uh, the same type of grass in his own yard and then allowed it to grow really long and then paid 200 people on horseback to take their horses across that grass in order to trample it down so he knew exactly what the specific type of grass at the battlefield looked like you know as horses were galloping across it uh, he studied um, uh, most likely um, dead horses you know propped up into position in order to understand you know how the light would affect uh, the musculature of a galloping horse um, anyway, he did that for all these details, and uh, um, that's absolutely um, amazing to think about the level of detail that goes into a picture like this, but also a little bit exhausting. And you can just imagine artists like Manet saying, uh, yeah, I want nothing to do with that. Um, how can we do something that's different? How can we um, make art about something different than realism? Remember, we've got photography now. Photography can show the real, right? It can capture a moment of frozen time. So let's find a way to make painting different. So let's look at a few Manet pictures. Uh, in his time, he was actually very much loathed and hated by the artist establishment, who artistic establishment, who, who just realized that he didn't play by the rules, right? He wasn't like other painters at the time. So uh, if you look here, uh, you know, here's an, uh, a great example. Uh, you've got this big uh, outdoor scene here, uh, people in Paris out on the street. Uh, notice how the whole upper half of the picture is, is kind of green blobs, right? Um, even the people in the foreground here, some of them stand out. You might notice a gentleman with a tall top hat and a red beard off to the left side of the picture. That is Manet himself. But the brushstrokes are kind of chunky. 
uh, not all together perfectly smooth together. Certainly the face is way off in the distance, and if you can look really close at your screen, you'll see that they're they're just kind of uh, blobs of color. Uh, it's hard to, for us now to see this and to imagine a time when that would have been seen as uh, you know scandalous, but to them, uh, this represented someone who clearly did not know how to paint. Because remember, uh, you're supposed to have this level of detail uh, when you make a painting. Uh, so, the way it works in France at this time, too, there's this crazy system that holds down artists who would dare think different about painting. Remember, the Academic Academy wants this kind of painting. And every year, they have an enormous uh, exhibition called the Salon. Today, uh, we use the word salon for like a hair salon. But back then, enormous exhibition. And it's the only way you can make money as a painter. You have to exhibit, uh, you, you, you get your painting into the salon. And, um, you know, thousands and thousands of people come and see this show. And uh, because it's in the show, they assume it's worth money and they will buy your picture. And that's how you make your living as an artist. If you submit a picture to the salon and the salon um, uh, doesn't... Uh, select it. And you can imagine them looking at a picture like this and saying, this guy has no idea how to paint. He doesn't know how to do the details, blobs of color in the distance. He doesn't paint like we think art should be painted. Well, then they would take a big stamp and they would stamp the back of the picture, um, a refuse or rejected or refused. And if that, if your painting had a big stamp on the back that said refused or rejected, uh, what collector is going to want to buy that picture? So, uh, Man A actually uh, was a guy who was constantly uh, in need of money and having difficulty staying afloat as an artist because he could not get anyone to buy his work or to take him seriously. Uh, and this is where Impressionism starts. It starts as a rebellion against a system that says painting has to be a certain way. It has to be detailed. It has to be over-the-top um, realistic. And um, the Impressionists, and we'll talk later about where that word comes from, the Impressionists thought differently about it. They said, no, we want to paint art that makes you feel things rather than art that shows you uh, complete and total realism. And uh, um, we'll talk later about um, Claude Monet. And Manet and Monet often get confused, but Monet was the one who, who coined the word um, Impressionism or a review for one of his shows coined the word Impressionism. And it was something they latched onto because they said, we're not actually painting... Uh, the world as it actually is. We're painting impressions of how we see the world or how we see light and color uh, affect the world. So uh, let's look at a few other Manet pictures. Um, Manet had an idea to, um, uh, instead of just settling for getting rejected all the time from the show, to have his own show. And he organized a group of other artists of which he was kind of the default leader, uh, and they had their you know own show called the Salon de Refusé, or the Show of the Refused. And the whole idea was, let's invite the people and show them what was refused, um, and let them be the judge of whether they think it should be refused or not. And uh, there were paintings that were absolutely hated, um, that uh, the public saw and, and made them extremely angry. Um, and uh, gradually, over time, uh, the public started to really embrace this new way of thinking about art, um, and it became more acceptable. But for many, many years, uh, it was, you know, people threw vegetables at these pictures. I mean, they hated, hated them. Uh, and there's instances of uh, people trying to slash pictures, and it made people that angry. Uh, here's an example of one. The em uh, execution of Emperor Maximilian. Um, quick history lesson about it. Uh, Emperor Maximilian, um, well, maybe uh, you, you might learn in your uh, history class, and I won't go into deep detail, but uh, Mexico was actually conquered by France for a, a, a quick second there, um, or became a French territory. And so um, they, um, the French put their own emperor um, you know, in charge of Mexico. His name was Maximilian. That's him right there getting shot, wearing a big hat, um, a sombrero-type hat. And um, the French were uh, not super smart because they uh, put their own emperor on the throne of Mexico and then basically um, pulled their troops out. And so what happened? Well, Mexican troops uh, rose up and just killed Maximilian and took their country back, and that was it. And people in France were um, quite upset about this, that their own government could abandon, um, you know, um, someone who they had set up as, uh, uh, you know, the emperor of their new territory, uh, 
you know, to just like, what was the point of all of that? And so, uh, man, a, for one of the, uh, salons, uh, knowing it was probably going to get rejected, created this picture, uh, of, uh, Maximilian's execution. Uh, it should, uh, draw to mind a very famous execution image we've already looked at, and maybe it's already crossed your mind, but Goya's 3rd of May, 1808, you can see how all the soldiers are on the right shooting the person on the left and how we don't see their faces and all that. Um, Mané, huge fan of Goya, actually traveled to Spain to um, uh, in search of Goya's images to try to learn how to become uh, that powerful of a painter. So certainly he's paying homage to, uh, to Goya here with this picture. Uh, but the funny thing about it is, uh, and the reason why people were so mad at this image, um, originally, and they've x-rayed this picture, originally the soldiers there who are shooting Emperor Maximilian um, were wearing uh, huge sombreros. He had no idea what Mexican soldiers looked like, so he just put them in huge hats and uh, kind of strange colored clothing. Um, and he hated it, and he actually painted the picture out. So if they x-ray under the paint, they can see you know, what he painted over. He painted their hats out, painted their uniforms out, and actually changed their uniforms so that the troops executing Maximilian are actually French. That's French blue, uh, French uniforms right there. So anybody seeing this would have seen, you know, the French army executing one of their own, which of course is not what happened, but also is kind of what happened because the French government just allowed this person who they put in charge of Mexico to get left there to get shot. And, um, uh, when you think about it that way, uh, this is kind of, you know, hyper political image that just enraged people at the time. Let's talk about luncheon on the grass here. Um, a extremely strange image when you think about it. Um, here we have uh, some people having a picnic. Luncheon's just basically another word for picnic. So you can see their picnic basket down there in the bottom corner and lounging in the park here uh, in the forested area. Um, but it's strange. Spatially, uh, the people are quite large compared to the trees around them. You see there's a, a woman um, bathing in the river behind but space is very odd. There's a boat behind the gentleman's head on the uh, right there. And uh, it, it's just difficult to tell um, where space is going. Big parts of the picture are just blobs of green for all of those woods. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and it breaks a lot of the rules. Uh, but that's sort of the idea. Of course, what's the elephant in the room with this image? Well, uh, we have two fully clothed men. Uh, and then one very naked, uh, woman here, um, sitting in total proximity to each other and not really, um, feeling odd at all <laughs> about this weird social pairing. I mean, this is a time when women, um, you know, are extremely modest in the way they dress to show your ankles, uh, or your wrists, you know, is to be scandalous here. Um, so why on earth is he messing around with the nude this way? Well, he's kind of, um, pointing the finger at the art establishment, the same people, uh, who think that, you know, art has to be extremely uh, perfected and detailed. And, uh, you know, one of the things they had every year in the big salon show were all of these nudes, female nudes. Why? Well, because throughout the history of art, uh, the nude, as we've seen, is something that keeps turning up. And, uh, wow, when a bunch of old French men are the ones making decisions, um, go figure. They're going to have a bunch of... Um, uh, scandalous pink female nudes are going to be common things in the show. So here, uh, he's kind of flipping the formula, daring them with the nude, you know, uh, kind of basically pointing his finger at them and, and calling them hypocrites here, uh, by creating his own nude, but he's doing it in a very awkward social way, two men and a woman here. Um, and, uh, you know, just putting them in a, a very extremely strange, awkward, uh, social situation that would have made people uncomfortable. And that's the idea. Last thing to say about it is the position of those three figures is actually borrowed from a Raphael uh, sketch called The Judgment of Paris. Uh, the Judgment of Paris, not the city, but of uh, the god Paris um, from mythology. So for all of those academic painters who would have had to study the old drawings of the Renaissance masters like Raphael, they would have known that the three people in this exact body position uh, would have been, you know... Um, playing off the words judgment of Paris, Paris as the city now. Uh, of course, he clothes uh, two of the men and, and leaves uh, the woman unclothed in a very awkward way, intentionally to make people uncomfortable. And this was a picture that, of course, he knew would get refused, and uh, he did it anyway. Uh, so, um, again, painting as open war on what art's supposed to be about. One of the debates of the day was about... Um, 
strange, uh, different views, uh, ways to see things in the world. So horse racing is a, is an odd one. You can look at how horses look in art and see some pretty strange, uh, uh, and different, uh, ways of making painting. So here's some Manet pictures. This, uh, this one, the horses are coming right towards us. How could we ever, you know, uh, stand and actually paint this image? We couldn't, right? The horses are coming right towards us. So you can tell it's in large part, you know, from his mind and imagination. And look at that crowd of spectators on either side. You can see how they're just blobs of color. Very odd. Um, unfinished almost. There was a raging debate at the time too about do all four of a horse's hooves come off the ground when a horse runs? Uh, some said, yes, absolutely they do. Others said, no. Um, well, look at this horse. Doesn't it look like it's uh, way too close to the ground, almost like it's, you know, um, about to lay down here. Uh, you can see some odd, really odd positioning of horses in some of these pictures. A few other Manet pictures here. This one's called The Dead Matador. It was originally part of a much larger picture that he probably uh, received so much criticism for that uh, he cut down and just left the canvas showing uh, this matador who's been stabbed here. This after his time in Spain, um, chasing Goya pictures as well and learning more about Goya. There's another one here called The Pfeiffer. And then finally for Manet, we'll leave you on this picture here. There's others we could show you, but... Um, there's so many, but um, this one here, just an odd um, uh, layout here that actually would not happen in real life. We see here a barmaid or someone standing at the bar preparing to give us a drink. And um, if you look behind her, there's a backside of another woman there. What you're actually looking at is a barmaid standing in front of a bar with a mirror behind her. So that woman off to the uh, right of the picture, that's actually supposed to be her reflection. And you can see a gentleman there in a top hat. Uh, that's supposed to be us as the viewer talking to the barmaid here, getting ready to order a drink. And if you look at the bottles on the table, they all line up, uh, you know, with the images from behind there as if we're seeing the reflection of the bottles. What's weird is that the whole reflection is offset way to the right. So it's an odd picture uh, in that way as well. Uh, also, uh, putting the viewer in an uncomfortably odd uh, situation here, um, uh, socially, uh, some have said that, you know, perhaps he's propositioning this woman, asking her to do something she doesn't otherwise want to do. Awkward social situation. Um, and again, uh, Manet sort of loves doing that sort of thing with his art, you know, making us um, have to think differently about what's being presented. So there you go, Manet. Uh, in a lot of ways, he became uh, kind of the default leader, like I said, for the Impressionists. And they, he was the first one to kind of break the mold and and make art a weapon against people who said that art had to be a very specific thing. All right, let's talk about our next one here. This is um, Edgar Degas uh, here. So Degas is D-E-G-A-S, D-E-G-A-S, Degas. And this is called Four Dancers, Four Dancers. And I hope that you can remember that for the quiz because there are four dancers in it. So there you go. I think you can remember that. Degas uh, was a contemporary of, of uh, Monet's and, and the other artists that we're going to talk about next week. And um, uh, you'll see some um, big changes here when you consider art kind of before Impressionism and, and now art during Impressionism. Um, look at the colors in this particular image. Uh, extremely bright color. Uh, one of the things that the Impressionists latched on to was, was bumping the color or the saturation of their pictures up. Uh, exponentially. Uh, photography, remember, is black and white at this time. It's also very slow um, and um, uh, very, you know, you have to sit completely still for a long time to get your picture painted or, or photographed, sorry. And so uh, painters are like, wow, one way we can make a difference is we can make you feel, right? We can latch on to color and the way that bright colors uh, draw your attention or the way that they make you feel. There's, we'll talk later, um, but there are emotional connections to color that we have. So they bumped up the color in their pictures. Look at these ballerinas here off to the side, bright red costumes, yellow and blue splotches, uh, uh, placed incredibly quickly, almost carelessly, uh, you could say, um, for their skirts, for the backdrop. What we're seeing here are four ballet dancers uh, behind a prop here, last minute adjusting their costumes here before they run onto the stage. And that's a painted backdrop of some 
haystacks behind them there on the stage at the ballet. Um, so look, he's given the attention to, to painting their faces, their arms, their torsos, and then everything else in the picture is, is almost blurry and very quickly and energetically placed. And the energy of that paint comes across and it feels very much like it's a live pulsing, uh, it makes you feel rather than just saying he, uh, you know, here are four very realistically painted dancers. Uh, look at their skin. Look at the girls' backs. There, there, there's teal and turquoise in their skin, orange in their hair, uh, in other colors as well. So, um, it's it's very different than the kind of academic painting that would have been considered at the time. And also a big black line uh, around their arms and parts of their bodies as well, which is just a huge no-no. You don't do that if uh, you're someone who actually knows how to paint at this time. Here's a self-portrait of Edgar Degas. If you can look at the um, younger, um, or the portraits uh, and pictures a lot of these artists painted when they were younger, um, most of the time they don't have the color. And that's because when they were being brought up as painters, um, this is what you do. You don't paint with bright colors. If you're gonna paint with bright orange and red, and that just shows you haven't mixed your paints. It shows that you uh, are not a good painter. Um, so if you look at their early pictures, like this uh, portrait of himself as a younger man, you can see there's a lot of gray, black, brown, that's what you're supposed to do. Everything's supposed to be muted. Bright colors are, are not supposed to be used that way. And uh, just for kicks, here's a uh, photograph of Edgar Degas as well. So Degas has a uh, thing about ballet dancers. You can look at different artists at this time and, and see how they painted in series. And Degas fascinated with the ballet. I mean, the ballet is enormously popular in France at this time. But in particular, um, uh, he's he, he just loves the energy of the dancers on the stage. Um, and he's really curious about how he can harness that into his painting, uh, rather than just showing you dancers to make you feel like you're part of the studio or sitting in the wings of a performance or, or watching what's happening so that you, um, as the viewer, can understand, um, you know, get a sense of uh, the life and energy in the ballet. So uh, one, um, another revolutionary thing he's doing here is he's thinking about ways to compose a picture that have never really been thought of before. Uh, at least to this extent. So look at this image right here. Uh, you know, if you think about the word compose, you think of like a, a composition, a music composition, right? Um, if you're composing a piece of music, you're placing notes on a piece of paper so that you know where they fit in the composition of the music. Well, in art, composition is where do you put objects, subjects, colors, where do you put them in a picture so that they line up in a way that visually reinforces uh, the overall message of the entire piece? And Degas is famous for using a diagonal. So look at how the ballerinas in this picture, um, they start in the upper left-hand corner. And there's a, you can almost draw a line from the upper left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, there's almost a line across, and he places the ballerinas along that line. So we see the feet of the ballerinas coming down the stairs in the upper left. And we see the ballerinas tying their shoes on the bottom right. And uh, the opposite corners are, are, are more open. So you'll see this in uh, these images here. Um, here's another one. Draw a diagonal line with your finger from the bottom left to the upper right. And you see how uh, it leaves the entire bottom right with this big open area, uh, big areas between the windows on the top. Uh, what that does is it, um, it, it, uh, it creates a very satisfying visual composition for us to look at. And it also um, makes us feel like we're kind of in the wings watching rather than just putting all of these ballerinas right in the middle of the picture. He does it in a way that uh, places us into the scene. Here's another, what it looks like, you know, at the ballet, off to the side here, looking down at the ballerinas on the stage. Once you start looking for the diagonal, it's, it's almost comical how easy it is to see. Look at the diagonal here from bottom left to upper right. People in the background are smaller. Obviously, ones uh, in the foreground are larger. We'll be talking about this with our space unit as well. Um, and, uh, you know, brighter use of color, use of uh, energetic brush strokes into the, uh, the tutus these ballerinas are wearing here. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, again, draw a line from the bottom left to the upper right, um, and that's where the figures fit, right? So we have this ballerina down at the bottom left who's either exhausted and taking a break or she's... Uh, um, dejected because she didn't get the part, right? Um, so we have this kind of intimate situation down there in the bottom. And then it goes all the way back to the upper uh, corner there where we see ballerinas way off in the distance uh, preparing for their rehearsal. So 
This is Degas, fascinated with how you can compose a picture, make somebody feel like they're there, give them a sense of, of energy about your subject matter. These are all things that photography can't exactly do yet. Uh, it's not in color, and uh, people have to stay still for an enormous amount of time to have their pictures taken. And so art is taking its place. It's trying to make you feel, and it's trying to, uh, uh, through bright color um, and unique composition of subjects here, um, uh, create you know unique new ways of showing art. Uh, Degas made a lot of pastels as well, so here's just a few more. Uh, I can show you, um, uh, ballerina here, uh, brushing her hair. You know, the whole idea of the pastel, pastels, you know, it, colored chalk, right? So you draw it quickly uh, uh, in order to get a sense of kind of a quick energy to a drawing. And, and it's seen as a drawing. It's not a painting. And the terms of academic art, you know, this is a sketch. Well, Degas sees them as paintings with chalk, kind of sees the quickness and, and the scratchiness of the chalk as a, a new way of showing that same energy too. So sometimes when you go to a museum, if you see a Degas picture, um, they're behind glass and they're, they're his original pastel drawings. Here's four more dancers and you can, again, see the diagonal from the top left to the bottom right. Almost done here. Uh, of course, more horses. We saw these with Manet, uh, but um, I love this uh, picture of, De, of Degas here. Uh, sunny day in the country. This is what you do. Bring your family out. Uh, bring your dog and uh, get, you know, get in a carriage here and um, uh, uh, get in the carriage and go out for a ride in the country here. If I asked most of you to uh, paint a picture of a family in a carriage on a, uh, a ride here, you'd probably at least put the whole horses in the carriage in the middle of the uh, picture so you could see everything. And you see here that um, Degas doesn't do that. He crops it way off down to the bottom. One of the horse's head is, is actually cropped off to the side of the picture. Um, the wheels, um, we only see part of the wheels. Why does he do that? Well, the family is not the subject matter, right? The subject matter is the feeling of being there on this day. And in fact, more than half of the picture is just this big dusty blue sky above us here. So that, um, instead it feels like we are there enjoying the day. And that's a, uh, again, all image composition and how we show our subject matter in a way that makes people feel like they're there rather than, um, presenting uh, images right in the middle of the picture as if they're the subjects. The subject is feeling like we're a part of what's going on. Uh, finally, for Degas, at the end of his life, began to lose a lot of his vision, which for um, artists is uh, a tough thing. Because how do you discern color and actually paint if you have trouble seeing? Well, Degas is pretty fascinating. He figured out that he could sculpt, and uh, and he could actually sculpt by feeling. So. Um, what he's doing here is actually uh, sculpting um, these ballerina dancers um, uh, by, by touch as he's lost most of his vision. Pretty amazing. But you can also see these in museums today, uh, sculptures of his ballerina dancers. So there you go. Uh, we're seeing this new movement called Impressionism, and we're seeing a, uh, um, an increased use of color and uh, composition, and also an entirely different way of challenging what art is supposed to be in France in the 1800s here. Uh, mayonnaise lunch on the grass, Degas, four dancers. That's our lesson for today. More to come. Thank you.